Today it's just basically a hash brown meal. There's some green onions and tomatoes and stuff like that. Um, and well this, but I have to wait until it thaws out a little more before James can eat it. I'm going to talk about dumb money a little bit. And I think James is going to talk about the politics and stuff like that a little more because I don't know oh, of this uh, dumb money. I like yeah. the French uh, translation. Beastly rich is basically what it is. Oh, okay. Yeah. So, yeah, this um, stars Paul Dano, which I, I like him a lot. And Seth Rogen's in this too, and he did a great job. You know, a lot of people um, did a great job. So. The cat um, does a great job there on top yeah. of the person's head. So, um, yeah, this... I hadn't heard about this at all, but apparently during the pandemic, there was this thing where people were buying um, some video video game store uh, shares, company shares. Yeah, they figured they, uh, people would be wanting to play video games, I presume, right? Well, um, I guess what had happened is this... Uh, Paul Dano's character, I can't remember what his name was, something yeah. Kitty or something, I think that's why he went with the cat thing, but okay. anyway, uh, whatever his name was, he um, liked the store, and I guess it, it's a chain thing, it's in malls or whatever, some okay. video games. So he liked a particular franchise. He liked the store, and then he, yeah. um, he, he was looking at it, and he thought, it's undervalued. The stock's undervalued, yeah. and so he um, did a lot of research into it and decided, okay, well, I'm going to put all of my, like, my family's, my he life had a little savings. baby and yeah. wife, he had put all of his life savings into this stock, and he's going online and he's talking about it and stuff. So it's not really clear in the movie if um, he has created this hype so that other people buy into the stock so that the stock goes up and he become, becomes wealthy or if he's actually like on the back of the box it's like the ultimate david versus goliath tale which i think that's quite likely because he didn't he could have sell, sold out many times and he didn't so because everybody was following him no. he was the internet presence that people were looking to and, and they were like well, if he hasn't sold, then I'm going to stay too, right? And I guess what had happened is Wall Street had decided they wanted to short, they were shorting the um, the company or whatever. They're shorting the stocks or however that works out. James will be able to say more about this sort of thing because I don't know, right? So anyway, um, the big billionaires were shorting this company and... Um, then all the people who work like minimum wage short of jobs or just average Joe sort of they're buying in to try to save this company basically like they're buying stocks in this company and they won't stop <laughs> and so they're costing the billionaires billions because they're waiting for they're betting on this co company going down going under and the average people keep making sure it doesn't. And awesome. <laughs> it's so awesome. So, um, yeah, at the end it says um, he, Paul Dano's, the guy he played, um, he retired, but um, he, they said at the end, this is just the start. This, you know, he got out, whatever, but this is just the start of this. And it's the people trying to make a stand. I mean, you know, you have a life savings and you don't know. That's honestly, you have, like, he started out, he put in 50 some thousand. Really, how long are you going to live on that? And I mean, a lot of people are in this these kind of positions. And in the United States, especially, so many businesses going under and so many people who were banking on a retirement you know they wanted to be able to retire and get a pension and stuff and then the business go under and they're just oh well too bad for you no pension no whatever you've just put in your whole life working for somebody 
and some company and the I mean the people owning the company they're probably loaded they're probably some of the billionaires but they're certainly not gonna give you your pension the company goes under and you're done yep. and that's what limited liability means yeah so I mean you have this sort of situation the people are seeing this in the United States and they're going okay well why are we working for these guys and they're not giving us enough money to retire on and we're not going to end up getting a pension out of working for them so what's what's the point right so it's awesome this is this was an awesome movie everyone did a good job and it's an awesome story because i guess we haven't been watching american television or whatever we, we would have heard about this on the news because james used to um like when i had um i would get cable for the summer months so that I knew what the weather was before I went into work because I worked the summers outside, right? You want to know, am I going to have to prepare for a bunch of rain or wind or whatever during the day? So, um, yeah, uh, James used to watch CNN and stuff like that so that he was on top of all that news. But I never watched Fox. I, I watched it for the first time and I... It's basically only the ones. It's, it's uh, it was absolutely the shocking. Okay. Fr how frankly evil it was. But. Well, you go on and talk about that whole the economics and politics behind that stuff because I don't really know a lot about it. So shorting a stock is um, it's kind of like a bet, although uh, most people are going to short are uh, presumably make an educated kind of guess and place it better. What you do is you buy a stock now, but on the agreement that you'll pay for it later. Are you taking a risk? If it goes down, it's cheap. You see how it works out? Yeah. But if it goes up, if you're betting incorrectly, you're going to pay a huge premium. And really, if you think about it, like watching what happened near the end of that movie, it's amazing how corrupt the system is and how much pull certain people have over government. Over yeah, over the whole economic system. Apparently, the government tried ridiculous. to block the screen. So shocking, but it shouldn't be. Now, uh, what? Economic theorists, like uh, classical theorists, say, "Oh, shorting is wonderful because it it helps make the market efficient. Everything that uh, benefits big capitalists makes the market more efficient." <laughs> the theory, actually, uh, but it, any little store, when all the little stores go under and there's nothing left but the big stores, you can see how. The very wealthy who own, who almost have a monopoly, and they want to have a monopoly. Well, they would put anything, any amount of their power, which some of it would be wealth too, right? But into trying to attain that goal, and they are. And you can see how fragile the system is that way if it's open to corruption like that. Well, I mean, uh, there's way too much interface with the political system. Mm -hmm. I mean, in the United States, you got separation of church and state, but you don't have separation of a uh, particular type of belief system, capitalism and state. So it causes all sorts of troubles. So, um, of course, in economic theory, any particular actor, uh, this is classical economic theory, is not supposed to be big enough in order to influence whatever market they're involved in. But uh, we all know that uh, capitalists, the big boys, are way too big. They, they can influence any market they're on. And so that's labor market. That's uh, They don't like unions. Unions are a way of uh, fighting that concentration of power in the hands of capitalists. And uh, they can, ma they, you look at Walmart, uh, but any, you know, Costco, so on and so forth, they can monopolize the um, market for goods. 
And one thing that they never talk about is they can monopolize the market for stocks. And so far as I know, I'm the first person to talk about that. Now, what happens is, uh, theoretically, if, if shorting worked perfectly, it'd just be a little small actor buying, uh, shorting a stock. But you see, what it is, is uh, Warren Buffett understands this. In 2008, he didn't want the market to crash. He actually believed in the system. Uh, he knew a crash was coming, and he refused to short the market. Why? Well, you know, like he himself wasn't... He, him pulling out of the market wouldn't have been enough to crash the market. But he was big enough so that if other people had seen him shorting, they would have shorted. There you See go. how it works and out? And so that's basically what people were doing in this story. They were watching this guy who he was posting okay I bought this stock this is my stock portfolio basically and here you can see this is where I'm where I'm into and so people were going okay well if he's in I'm in well that's uh, he's just a small time player <laughs> when you say the st stock market was uh, shorting the market it's uh, the big players were shorting this uh, thing right mm. and they were going to run it down and, and make uh, a huge fortune a killing off of killing off this company. Yeah, but a lot of people, though, what I'm saying is they will watch certain people. They will watch uh, certain and players. And they just yeah. work off of that. And so, so that could have been, example. like in the movie at one point, um, somebody was saying, if you're buying into this stock to make money, get get out of here. You know, if this is what, what you're all about. Like, because they, this was a political movement, yeah. apparently. Yeah. Like, it was like so, a revolution. Actually, what, uh, what, um, it's actually an evolution. It's not a revolution. No one's getting killed or anything. No, no. It's good. Actually, it's the kind uh, I like. They're actually it's, um, saving the system. Yeah. You see, uh, the trouble with shorting, it's a revolution I, I don't of the know mind. How, how they People should allow... Together. I don't know if they should allow it because what happens is this company might have been perfectly good and these guys were just going to run it into the ground. There are all sorts of problems with capitalism, the way it's set up. Well, I mean, they were saying... Um, they were looking at things and saying, well, this... People buy, download video games online. Mm -hmm. So buying into a video game store mm -hmm. where you buy a video game, it's really kind of obsolete. They were comparing it to Blockbuster Video, right? And in a way, I can kind of see that. But with Blockbuster Video, you're buying something that you're, or renting something that you don't want to watch again usually. Usually okay. you're watching fiction, watching, yeah. like I get them from the library, I got this yeah. from the library. Mm -hmm. And it was good, but I'm not going to watch it again. And with playing video games, though, people play those things over and over and over and over. Well, there you go. See, so they, I don't know they, if that's really the, the same thing. The dumb money was the, uh, was the, these experts who thought, oh, it's going to be like video. Well, there's video, that, videos. but then there's also the looking at it like, People really have to stop renting things, buying things, paying money for temporary pleasure or use or whatever. It's not going to get you anywhere. So well, it's a little bit like fast food. There's like that, right? You look at it like that. You're and you're paying a, a huge fortune. So uh, right now, what the uh, uh, you know, it used to be that you could kind of watch sports on public TV but uh, where they're moving now is that you got to subscribe to watch whomever so poor people won't get to see this stuff and they're actually going to benefit you know like I don't suffer from uh, not being able to watch uh, sports I pr probably benefit I've got more time you know? um, and it's uh, that way with all the sort of stuff video games are just a huge waste of time waste of time but at any rate, uh, you know, like this could happen to any sort of uh, company. So these idiots, uh, the dumb money, the big uh, rich guys, they were betting on it. It could, it could have been a company that actually was serving a useful. Yeah, it would have been purpose. better had it been that, mm -hmm. but it turned out it was this, right? Well, I mean, it it doesn't matter because it's the principle of the thing. Yeah. And they could run something into the ground, 
there, there's another way, uh, there are probably many ways that you run stuff into the ground. Back in the 80s, as mentioned, to Pauline, in connection with this, when she was talking about it uh, to me earlier, I was mentioning in the 80s, I was already shaking my head, you know, because there were people over at the city hall, you know, like in management, they were saying, yeah, we're turning into a service economy, and the rest of the world is going to produce our goods for us. And I'm going, but you have no clue, no clue. Uh, you know, like, you'll just become ma money managers, yeah. but ultimately you get replaced by the people who are producing the goods. And, yeah, you know, I mean, people the, are going the around saying, we can't do anything about a certain mm -hmm. pandemic. I'm not going to say which one. Because uh, because uh, China produces too many uh, goods for us, yeah. and I'm going. Uh, you better do something because it's only going to get worse. This dependence on them producing goods. Yeah, I mean we were uh, hearing about Britain recently, and uh, we were listening to a history uh, CD, audio book on uh, on the way, and they were saying I hadn't realized this, but I guess. Um, during the Industrial Revolution and stuff, but Britain was so far ahead because they were producing. Stuff I mean, because of the spinning, rate. spinning jenny, is that what it's called? They were producing so much cotton, cotton jenny. Well, um, so it was something like 50% of the world's cotton or something was coming from Britain. Yeah, and, and wool. Yeah, and wool too. You see, initially, that's the first stage of the Industrial Revolution, pretty well anywhere. Yeah. You go, uh, you know. So uh, that's what made. Me, that's why uh, Engels and Marx were so thrilled about Manchester because uh, they didn't realize in the long run Birmingham would surpass Manchester. Yeah, but Manchester. you have to actually produce something to get ahead. Is what I'm saying. Yeah. It, so uh, what uh, the service industry basically, uh, ha what America has been, and uh, Europe to a certain extent lesser extent has been is uh, a money. consumer consumer civilization oh, it's not good well I mean uh, I'm talking about money management and uh, oh. there is the consumer sort of thing mm -hmm. money management that's the service industry and I, I'm going you guys have no clue you're going to get replaced unless you're actually producing goods what uh, money management is is just parasitism you know, you're not producing anything that people want and uh, even someone that I kind of admire, like Warren Buffett, he's, he's honest about things. I think he's one of the few billionaires who support the uh, Democratic Party. So he didn't want to short the market in 2008. He's the one I saw in a documentary that Pauline had. It wasn't a mockumentary, it was a documentary where he was complaining about his tax rate. There was another billionaire, a uh, multi-billionaire, complaining about his tax rate. Warren Buffett was complaining about a 13% tax rate. This other guy was complaining about an 8% tax rate. But Warren Buffett was saying, unlike the guy with the 8%, that his tax rate was too, he's being honest, it was too low. The guy uh, thought his 8% tax rate, the other guy, thought it was too high. I mean, when is, uh, when is, uh, when, are, when are you going to get enough money? You know, really what it is, is uh, money it's is power. power, right? That's what they want, they want as much power as possible. So, um, it's, uh, what uh, what they were doing is, uh, it got really bad in the 80s, it's probably, uh, they were doing mergers and acquisitions. So, uh, what would happen is, uh, th this is how, we, we, Consumerism is one of the ways the United States became the world's biggest debtor country. When Reagan took over, they were the world's biggest creditor. You got that? They went, they've gone in a little over a generation from being the world's biggest creditor nation, where people owed them money, to being the world's biggest debtor nation. And that's because the rich guys refused to pay taxes under him and under his uh, various successors, and stuff like that. Okay? And uh, mergers and acquisitions, what they'd be doing is borrowing a huge amount of money, a lot of it from the Chinese, that's the People's Republic of China, uh, in order to acquire a uh, company. And then to pay back this huge debt that they, it, so it'd be some, just some, some flunky, it could be who's just kind of persuaded the banks to give them money. Uh, then what they do is they just rape the company from within, and then they uh, then they sell it off. They just 
it, it's like uh, parasitism. They just eat the thing, eat up from within, and uh, just kill off the company in order to make money. Mergers and acquisitions. Check it out. I could be making it up, but you better be knowing that I'm not. Yeah? And, uh, you know, like, uh, I can remember my forum. It's a pretty intelligent guy. The only management guy with this management type of guy, wasn't management, strictly speaking, who uh, I had any respect for. He actually had a degree. And the education degrees, he educates you. Uh, it was parks construction. It was uh, landscaping. But uh, I can remember when 2008 happened, uh, in the wake of it, he's no longer my foreman. I think it was when we bought the car in 2010. So we're talking about cars, and uh, yeah, that's right. Uh, we bought a American product. And he was saying, uh, you know, like he, he didn't believe in American cars, uh, even though he owned a 68 or 69 Mustang. And it was a second-hand but, car. And it was uh, James's first car. Not the Mustang. No, but, your yeah. car. Yeah, exactly right. And uh, so we looked at one junk mobile. He said, no way. I mean, you could kind of hear the ping when the motor ran. So we went to another place. It was a Ford dealership, but uh, oh, we bought a Dodge there used. <coughs> and he, he said, this is a good car. And I said, um, I, I said to him, I thought you didn't like American cars. And he said, you don't know what Obama did when he took over, eh? He, uh, uh, he, he said, here's what happened. He asked me, what place turns out the best engineers in the world? Well, the place with the best universities in the world is still the United States. By far, Ivy League universities and non-Ivy League universities. They produce the best engineers in the world. They don't produce the most engineers in the world, but the best. And here's what he said in the wake of 2008, Obama forced the big three car makers in the United States to hire qualified engineers. In other words, people who graduated from American colleges. They, they were forced to do that by Obama. Forced. Because they didn't want to do it. They were too busy raping the companies from within. Pardon my borderline French or whatever. That's what they were doing. They were just turning out junk and and stuff like that. So Obama, by forcing them, I, I think Ford was okay, but uh, he took over, kind of took over General Motors and uh, Chrysler, or Dodge Chrysler or whatever. Yeah, stunning, stunning how badly capitalism uh, in uh, modern day form has served the United States. It's what it's turned into is a it's parasiting. It doesn't even handle uh, things uh, properly. Uh, just uh, and it's like I said after 2008, after that crash, I said, you can't. I don't want to hear any arguments for capitalism anymore. None of the uh, stuff that's coming out of the Republicans and the Conservative Party, traditional Conservative Party, and, and you know what? That's what happened. But instead of people uh, going, okay, let's be sensible about this, let's get like uh, worker d democracy, not necessarily s social welfare state, but where workers actually share in the uh, power of the company, power sharing. Um, what they did was they turned to extreme solutions. So they turned to uh, Trump on one hand, and they turned to too many of them turned to Bernie Sanders on the other hand. Here in Canada, it was the NDP influencing the Liberals to move one way, and now we've got Pierre Polyev or whatever his freaking name is. How much time? Five? Yeah, about that. Yeah. So, you know, uh, yeah, it's uh, people, I, you know, poor David Frum, he, I, I can recall an opinion piece he wrote, there. maybe several of them, complaining about how uh, Trump took over the Republican Party. Your Republican Party was a sham, useless. 2008 is a is is something like fate's, not God's, judgment on your slimy, sleazy handling, mishandling of the economy. Your traditional Republicans, it's like I said in the wake of 2008. I never want to hear from you idiots again. You guys are useless. You're not as useless as Donald Trump. 
And actually, you're probably not as useless as Bernie Sanders. Both of these idiots are Russian agents. Check it out. You know, I was talking to uh, some poor benighted individual saying, you know, he, he was saying, oh, Bernie Sanders, this was in the wake of 2016, will never run again. I said, what? You're so confident. I'm pretty sure he will. And of course he did in 2008. And I was saying, look, he's getting money from right-wingers in order to split the, up the uh, Democratic Party. Oh, no, no, no. Come on. Uh, Bernie Sanders is electable. Then it turns out, then it turns out that uh, that uh, Bernie Sanders is getting money, was getting money from Putin. Presumably he's getting money for this election from Putin to split up the Democratic Party and get uh, Donald Trump elected. Oh, you know, you think Bernie Sanders would have been shamed. Into, that came up before 2020. Would have been shamed into not running. But no, he had to run. Now, I don't know what his game is, whether he's that cynical uh, that he just wants to get, I, I'm sure he's getting a lot of slush money from Putin and other rich people, but uh, rich people in the United States to uh, make sure that Donald Trump wins. But uh, I, I don't know, maybe he thinks that he, once he gets in the catbird seat, then he'll, then he'll handle things and uh, tell Putin to get lost or whatever. I can't imagine that. The guy's as much of a coward as uh, Jimmy Carter, probably worse. Um... It'd be a foreign policy disaster, I'm afraid. Way worse than uh, Jimmy Carter. Oh, um, you know, uh, you know, someone once said, may you live in interesting times. It was like a curse. And, uh, <laughs> yeah, we're living in two interesting times. And it's because you folks out there, this includes uh, people that are, are good in heart. You aren't keeping track. You aren't keeping track of what people are doing, saying, you uh, you you just keep doing the knee-jerk reaction uh, to things. Things uh, that 60s kind of folks, uh, you're is. still doing, you still got 60 solutions. Understand, you let hefty, shifty, hefty, shifty, nifty, hefty lefties have done a bait and switch. You know, originally it was about, uh, about uh, equality for people inside the United States, or inside Canada, or inside Europe. And now all of a sudden, uh, you know, like if you didn't go along with their program, and I agreed with the program back then, uh, you know, like uh, getting blacks a legitimate vote in the United States, or African Americans, whatever you want to call them, or don't want to call them, and uh, stuff like that. But then all of a sudden now, you get these nifty, shifty, hefty lefties like the NDP, the Labour Party, and England, uh, Social Democratic Party and places in Europe, uh, the left wing, the extreme left wing, and there's too many of them, and of the Democratic Party in the United States, or the independents like Bernie uh, Sanders, what they want to do, they've done a bait and switch. All of a sudden, they don't represent uh, people in the United States. They represent people outside the United States or outside Canada. And they're supposed to come in and flood these various countries and, uh, you know, like, uh, it's, it's stunning. I was hearing today on CBC, there was some, it was a school in Pickering, that's eastern Toronto, or east of Toronto, I don't think it's right in Toronto, uh, where they were singing the Pan-African hymn, or national anthem, or whatever. You know, Pan-African nationalism is Nazi, Nazi socialism, okay? It's, it's you know, Nazi communism, really. And what are they doing singing it? I mean, it's a, basically, it's an advertisement for colonizing and imperializing Canada. 